Glasgow students even used to pay for their lectures by providing the corpse for the next lesson. Hello, I'm Natalie from Genealogy Stories and welcome to Twice Removed, the show where we talk about everything history related. Hi Susie. Hi yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining me today. I'm really excited to talk no. to you. <laughs> All about dead bodies on a, on a Friday night at seven o'clock. Can't beat exactly, it. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so could you tell me a little bit just to start with, why were people robbing bodies? Why were people taking bodies out of graves and 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 when? Like the not, real basics. <laughs> not for the sheer fun of it, I'll tell you that for nothing. Um, so basically you've got a rise in in the teaching of medical uh, of anatomy and um, the private anatomy schools. So around 1750s, private anatomy schools are really like, exploding in London and they've got, they're, they're um, going unchecked. There's nobody kind of putting any, any barriers on anything. And the way that these guys are advertising their lessons, their, you know, their anatomy classes is to say, hey, we've got a cadaver if you go to the teaching hospitals, you might not get one, but we've got one. And everybody thought, you know, that to, to learn anatomy, there's two different, two different camps, really. Some people thought you needed three cadavers in order to learn anatomy successfully. So that would be one to learn the human structure on, you know, the, the, the anatomy on, one to learn um, operations on, always handy. And then one, two, two, well, just keep keep practicing, really. You might need to cut that bit out because I can't remember what the third bit is. <laughs> <laughs> but there's also a second camp that says you need the bits of a cadaver to make up, you know, like one. So there's two different camps, but there's certainly the need for extra bodies. And the legal, the legally available quota was only about six. So even with the 1752 Murder Act, it bumped it up to about 13, 12 or 13. Is that the, is the Murder Act that, that they could take the bodies of people who'd been hung? Yeah, so you're, you're, you've committed murder, then you, you, you're, you're hung and part of your sentence is, after you've died, you then get to, to be anatomized, to dissect it. So it's part of the, the punishment, as it were. And they only went to the to the teaching hospital, the Royal College of Surgeons. So um, all the private anatomy schools had to get their their cadavers from elsewhere. Now, in the beginning, uh, the students would do it themselves. So um, certainly in London, mainly in Edinburgh and Glasgow. So Glasgow students even used to pay for their lectures by providing the corpse for the next lesson, which is fabulous. Um, but they would go out and, and rob the graves themselves. Um, I didn't really make a very good job of it. So they would, they would leave, you know, like um, coffin, um, uh, burial shrouds strewn across the, across the graveyard. They'd leave evidence basically that they'd, that they'd been there. And as the, the student numbers rose and as it became a little bit hotter, to, for, for students and, and doctors and anatomists to be in the churchyard, the graveyard, they would uh, look elsewhere for other people to, to get the cadavers. And then so slowly you start getting the professional coming in. And that's when it really, well, I'll say that's when it gets really exciting because it's just as exciting when the students are doing it because they're just, to me, they're bumbling idiots. Do you know what I mean? Compared to the, to the professional who've got it absolutely licked. <laughs> I've just got this vision, you know, I just I remember being a student myself and having an obligatory um, shopping trolley in my garden for, for a year and some traffic cones, you know, and it just it, I, 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 can, I can literally just, you know, I can visualise it that the, the bumbling, uh, probably uh, slightly drunk oh, yeah. student. You know, some things never change, do they? It does. They Sorry don't. to any students listening. <laughs> I know, I'm sure you're working well, yeah. very hard as well. It's uh, some of some of the things I mean, I'm reading recently. Um, because I write my blog every, you know, every week, I'm trying to get some things out. So I'm reading constantly. And, and it's just dawned on me this last week, I keep coming across this same story. Uh, two students from Glasgow, uh, Glasgow University, Glasgow Medical School, and they come, uh, come and rob the, the grave. And they have to go through the toll booth at Gorbals, uh, get past the, the toll booth keeper, the gatekeeper. And they think, who is... Um, 
he's passionately anti body snatchers, which a lot of people, I don't think everybody was pro body snatching other than the surgeons, do you know what I mean? But they, uh, they thought, how do we get him past here? So they dressed the corpse up, which I think was a woman off the top of my head. They dressed the corpse up in uh, old clothes with just a cloak or like something that they had with them and popped it in the middle of the seat at the front of the, of the gig. So there was a, you know, the student, student, and this dead corpse in the middle propped up. And I have read the same story this week um, um, in Fife, I think in Edinburgh, um, certainly in Glasgow. I came across, and I came, I've come across two more, and I think they're both in London this week. So that's five different variations on the same story. And it's just like, ah, wet. And I've just been talking to, to, to my mum, funnily enough, about, can you imagine? dressing a, a corpse up and putting it. I and mean, it's a different take on each of the stories. So the one in, in Gorbals, they went through and the, the caps took down and the collars all tucked up. And this, you know, this corpse is kind of there, like probably nodding as the cat's going, <laughs> do you know what I mean? <laughs> and um, the, the gatekeeper says, oh, you know, you know how, how is he? And they said, oh, he's not, he's not very well. You know, we need to get him home. Okay, you know, swiftly go, lads, you know, on your way. And they pay the, pay the keeper and off the go. Um, one of the others, they have him, um, they stop outside for a drink, outside the pub for a drink. And um, the bar, you know, the the I don't know, pop boy or whatever it was called, like in the, the 19th century, I don't know, comes out and says, you know, do you want a drink? And he says, yeah, we'll just have like two drinks. And so, well, what about the guy in the middle? <laughs> and it's just like, uh, so yeah, so students had enough. Had the fabulous <laughs> tales with them. Do you think some of these tales go down in sort of urban legend, and that's why you've kind of heard Absolutely. them so many times? Yeah. Absolutely. Got the, 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 you read something and you think, mm, hang on, I've, I've read this exact same count. I'm reading about Irish body snatchers, funnily enough, at the moment. And the stories there, you think, hang on, this, this happened, you know, in Scotland or, or somewhere, somewhere in England. You know what I mean? There are very, whether they want to claim the story for themselves and have a little bit of, you know, parish, parish folklore. There is, um, I don't know if you've been following a blog, I did an a post recently on Dandy Jim, who is from Eckford Churchyard. His is another um, swapping the well corpse in the gig kind of story. Um, he, uh, Dandy Jim, is walking back from his sweetheart, uh, goes past the churchyard on his way home, and spots a lamp in the behind the gravestones, kind of wiggling around. Uh, suspects it's body snatchers. Sees their horse and cart tied up. Uh, next to a tree, uh, unties it and sends it off across the field. So he's he's let their you know getaway vehicle escape kind of thing. As they're running across the field to try and find it and and catch it and bring it back, he swaps places with the corpse that's already kind of tied in this sack like and, and tarpaulin and stuff and um, lies next like down by the side of the grave. Not quite sure what he does with the with the body. Actually, that bit seems to have come out of the story. But he anyway, he makes it up into the cart, into the back of the cart, and you know he's the, the there and the, the, the trotting home and says, you know, but this, this corpse is a bit warm, isn't it? <laughs> and then it says from that that the story for for Eckford Watch how, uh, Tower it derives from that. It's been built because of that story. Do you know what I mean? And it's like, oh, so you know, people are like. They do big it up. Yeah, so, <laughs> absolutely. So, so you, you mentioned a watchtower there. Is that literally a, a small tower that's been built in a churchyard in order to, to kind of keep an eye out to see whether anyone's going to come along and rub the graves? Pretty, pretty much. It's a bit of an elaborate watch house. So you, you watch house, and you've probably seen them as you've been going around. If you've been going around graveyards yourself, usually they're just very simple structures. Um, one side of the, the wall is probably built in the churchyard wall um if not they're just rectangular little buildings simple uh simple window etc and your watch tower is a bit more elaborate so there's some great ones at St Cuthbert's in Edinburgh um Dalkeith and Eckford so Dalkeith is in Edinburgh and Eckford just on the borders they're nearly identical little turreted style kind of you know um, um chess sets as you get the little rook yeah is it the rook yeah 
the castle. The castle one. one. <laughs> yeah. Of course, it would be. Um, it, the, the little 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 versions of those. Ah. I, I think it was it was more um, what you could afford. A lot of a lot of places um, probably repurposed uh, buildings. Um, there's a couple in Aberdeenshire that, or certainly one in Aberdeenshire that I know is, is two story. So below is like a mort house, and then above would have been the, the watch house. Um, I was you know, just going to say, I wonder whether they made use of it. So I'm just thinking if my local church has got a little um, chapel arrest or a little moored house attached to it, I wonder whether they just doubled it up. You know, they just yeah. used what they already had. A, um, a lot, yeah, a lot of them would have. You, you can, as soon as you, once you get your eye in, you can start noticing them because they're just, they're just so simple. Some have a little chimney, not always. Um, and usually the, the uh, window is facing out. So it looks through the, through the, uh, to the graveyard so and how what, what other kind of prevention methods did um oh. do people use and how how did that well there's kind of several questions there but how did that change over time as I well love prevention. Okay. <laughs> i love prevention um there's there's two the two there's probably three camps of uh, where you can put prevention you've got your poor prevention so those that wouldn't have been able to afford anything like the mort safe mort stone or cage layer that i'll tell you about in a second so your your poor prevention was more um, a bit more like just putting them off if you if you could really. So they tended to put um, straw or stones into the soil as they put it back into the into the grave, mainly to to slow down the digging, make a noise. Although they did use wooden shovels, so you know, but, but mainly to slow down the digging. Um, and then if they didn't do that, what they would have done on the mound, they would have put. Um, mound so sorry uh, <laughs> they would have put um, a little pile of stones or a little pile of sticks or maybe some flowers um, there is a, a, a tale where um, body snatchers targeted a, a the grave of, of uh, wasn't a pauper but it was someone who couldn't afford you know any any luxuries in the body snatching prevention world and they placed some flowers over the uh, over the grave and he stole one and, and had it as his buttonhole as he sauntered off. But the poor would have placed these on the graves and uh, go the next morning and see if they were disturbed. They would look at them and think, oh, well, nothing's happened to them. So that's it. My loved one's still in the grave. But in the meantime, the, the body snatcher would have come and made a made sketch or a mental note. Sometimes they had uh, women that um, scouted around the, the churchyard during the day to look for these things. And they would have, you know, made a note of like the pattern of the sticks and everything, and then just returned it. So that was a bit. It kind of also was a bit of a a Belisha beacon, like here's here's a new burial. Yeah, do you know what I mean. Yeah, I do. Yeah, that's I can so, understand. I, yeah, that's quite it, sad actually. It is very that sad. That makes you sort of see it from the. I know because I know we laugh a lot, but yeah, you you can see how yeah it would, would have been absolutely gut-wrenching and totally yeah. distressing to find out that your loved one would be disturbed like that oh, the more the more so when I first started off researching all of this um for my undergrad did dissertation and I literally absorbed it all like a sponge to get my to get my dissertation out do you know what I mean and as I've had the the luxury of time a bit I suppose my thinking's changed and I am starting to look at it more from the the snatched person's point of view um, and, and look at it more away from like what would have actually happened and do you know what I mean as opposed yeah. to just the, the body snatching the body snatching side but let me tell you about the other the yeah other go for it no, no, sorry no, no, I, I feel tend to go off on tangents all the time please do um, <laughs> <laughs> so you had you had the 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 poor would have done that you also had uh then had mort stones which are big, literally lumps of stone that would have um, gone over the top of the, the burial, top of the coffin after the burial. Um, stayed there in situ for about six weeks until the body's no use anymore. But the body snatchers could get round this, so they would have I've actually got a little coffin uh, here on my desk. I don't know if you can see. <laughs> I got sent this um, actually by, by someone on, on Twitter, poor Frank Raw. He sent me it because he, he did paperweights, but it broke. And the lid comes off. And I'm oh. like, well, this is everybody snatching historians' dreams. So for anyone listening, it is literally just a mini, a mini coffin. A little like mini. About the size of your palm of your hand. Yeah, it's a little mini paperweight as a coffin. It's fabulous. 
but I got given a, 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 a broken one. But for a body snatching historian that snaps in half, it's just fabulous. <laughs> anyway, so the mort stone would have gone over the top, but they they figured out and they just dug down at the sides. Okay. So they uh, broke the sides and they could get into the, to the coffin that way. And was a mort stone literally a really, really heavy stone? Absolutely, yeah. Just a big lump. So it still would have been um, put into situ probably with what we call a lifting tackle, which was like a tripod. And it would have had um, chains or ropes from, from the centre and hooks that would have hooked onto the, to the stone to lift it off. They developed into the mort safe. So typically the Aberdeenshire mort safe with the iron skirt around it. Okay. Um, yeah, I'll send you some pictures for that, obviously. Um, and they're, they're typical to Aberdeenshire. So you've still got the heavy mort stone on the top, but the, the skirt, which goes about 16 inches into the ground, is designed to stop them getting, getting at the side. At the That's side a the long top. way as well. It is Especially to way. have to dig with a with a with a wooden spade. Yeah, well, they would have just the seen it and and thought, you know, yeah. and, and and left it alone. There there are some that you I have read accounts where the the, the more safe has been removed, and then years later they've gone to bury somebody else in the same grave, and the coffin's empty, and it's like, mm, yeah. <laughs> how have they got in there? Then? See the vampires they, or uh... <laughs> exactly, exactly. They would have definitely. They, well, I know they would. They would have got in. They would have got in. They were very, very cunning. Um, but these, these, um, I'll send you a picture of the Bolton Mort safe as well, which is um, probably one of the best examples. Um, there's, I think there's, there's, I can't remember how many holes around the, around the sides, but iron rods used to drive down into the side. So where Aberdeen's got the skirt, the others, um, two, you would have had two halves, like Ayrshire Mort safes in two halves. And uh, these clasped literally like around around the, the top and the bottom of the coffin like that. And then iron rods would have gone in, um, thrust down and into the soil as well. So, so, so almost like a trap, almost like yes, a clasp, very much. like a bear trap. Like, yeah, like a cage. Yeah. Yeah. And they, they, they were left in situ again for six weeks and then pulled out and then re, and reused. You've also got another, another style, which is like a, an iron coffin, more like a sheath that was an, a thick iron, really heavy iron over coffin, as it were. So you, you're, your coffin's buried and then this, this other coffin goes on top. Uh, it's left there again for six weeks and then it's pulled off. Um, oh, okay, so they wouldn't, they wouldn't keep it on there, they'd reuse it. Mm, yeah, and so you had, go on. Did you hire it then? Mm, hire, mm. Ah, okay. Well, there's, there's two. So you could have had the parish mort safe. So the ones at um, Aberfoyle in Stirlingshire is, would have been a parish mort safe. Ayrshire, the Air mort safe, Bolton. Um, so they would have been, you'd have had a subscription. So you'd have, you know, uh, gosh, a couple of pence a week. They'd have joined in for a couple of pence a week. And you would have got to, to use the, the parish mort safe. Not quite sure what they would have done if a couple of people died <laughs> at the same time. Um, but some of these places did have, um, oh, it's Ann, Ann Struther, I think it is, had about uh, three or four. There's quite a few places that would have, would have wrapped them up, you know, um, got quite a few, especially if they're around the anatomy schools. So like around Aberdeen had quite a lot, individual parishes had quite a lot. And people gifted them as well. So... Um, there is in St. Fittix in Aberdeenshire, just on the on the um, on the coast, um, gentleman gifted a mort stone there. Uh, there was a very famous snatching there, actually, by some student body snatchers. They uh, stole poor Mrs. Janet Spark uh, a few days after Christmas, and um, she. I don't know why I'm laughing. <laughs> It's just because the story's quite funny. Well, I th it's not funny. It's my coping mechanism. And I know what you mean. Sorry. And she, anyway, she's stolen uh, three days after Christmas, 90-year-old Janet Spark. And the, the, um, the students are thinking, hang on a minute, we've been rumbled here. We're just going to pop Janet in the sandy banks of the Bay of Nig. And we'll come and get her later when, this, when it's calmed down a bit. And of course, it's winter and the storm brews up, and it means they can't go and get her. 
and um it's well they never do go and get her actually a couple of months later she's washed free of the sandy banks and is comes to comes to rest on the the banks of the of the uh, of the bay of nig poor woman it's as you know but the, 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 i mean the the students there left a spade uh with a with a name ray and i think it was attributed back to a a surgeon um so it was this, uh, the student's father was a, an eminent surgeon and he'd stolen his shovel and it was like, oh, absolute uproar. And I think he had to get he had to leave town or something like that. It's all very, very quite taboo. But uh, but then the Mortstone was gifted after this. And it's like, well, you know, it's like the horse is bolted kind of. <laughs> a lot of places do that. <laughs> OK, that's really yeah. interesting. Did um, you mention there about about um being suspected of, of, of grave robbing and, and kind of having to move town do you get um do you get people who were who were kind of known as grave robbers as in they'd been maybe convicted and got off because of a lack of evidence or they'd been convicted and come out and done it again and they became known as like you know there he is <laughs> yeah nudge, nudge. <laughs> it's gary the grave robber again you know so you know <laughs> Wonder where he's <laughs> yeah, well, nobody, nobody will drink with him in the pub anymore. You know, I just, I wonder whether you get that kind of, you know, because obviously you get notorious thieves that are continually released yeah. um, in in other walks of life, and I just wonder whether it was the same for grave robbing. Um, I th there is the prolific ones, obviously. I do um, have a body. Well, I say I have a body snatcher. I have so I've got this database of around two hundred and fifty individual names it's just crazy and uh and i was actually hoping you were going to say to me what's your family history research like this when it started because i was like i haven't got one but this is it this is my family history um so i've got all of these individual guys and there's the odd ones keep cropping up in time and time again i've just um written about it actually on my blog um in Essex, a place called Little Lees in Essex, a body snatcher, Samuel Clark, I think his name was, he stole a cadaver and was transported. Unusual, so he's probably stolen. I can't remember if he stole grave clothes, he probably did um, transported. Turns up again about 17 miles away, seven years later. And in the newspaper, it says, you know, that this Samuel Clark, he was transported for the very same crime. Uh, and here he is, he's literally walked off the boat and, and started straight again, which I think is quite, I'm like, that's gold dust for me. As a, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Not so much for the person that's getting snatched, but for me. It, it must have been, I'm, gu I'm guessing it must have been quite lucrative then. You know, oh, massively. To, to be transported massively. and still want to carry on with it. So how much could you earn for a body? So it, it, it as, as demand grew, obviously, prices increase so in the beginning <clears throat> when you're around 1810s when it really starts to pick up with the professional you're looking at about four pounds four shillings for an adult that's anything over <clears throat> three feet and then um, anything smaller than that so the terminology is a small large small or a fetus would have been uh, three feet or shorter and they would have been priced by the inch and as time's going on, certainly, so like in 1816, there's a lot of, um, not gang rivalry, but but um, it's, the anatomists in London are trying to get the supplies from elsewhere because the prices are getting hiked up by the this you know prominent gang in London called the Borough Gang or the Crouch Gang. And they're driving the price up because they know that their commodity is, is, you know, is really, is valuable. And so prices are, are eking up. And um, so around 18, 1816, you get the great cutting scandal and then prices have gone up to 12 guineas, I think it is. Hang on. I think it's 12 guineas. Six guineas. Doesn't go up till 12 to later on. <laughs> OK, uh, how much how much was sort of six guineas? What could you buy with six guineas? That. What we need to do is pop on to the National Archives. Yeah, that's, I was just going to say National Archives. I know, because th then, then you might not need to cut it because it'll be interesting. So, yeah, there's the, the National Archives currency converter tool, which uh, is basically a bit like your foreign exchange currency converter, but it, it converts money either old to new or new to old 
and tells you how much it would have been worth and how much they would have been able to buy. And I think I think it does wages, doesn't it? And then it also tells you how many sheep and things like that, or how many horses, how many bushels of wheat, that kind of thing. So it's it's, it's a really good tool. So the same six pounds in eighteen ten is two hundred, just shy of two hundred eighty pound. Yeah, that's quite a lot. Which is a lot. So if you think, if you so there's the Diary of a Resurrectionist that is that is um, eighteen eleven to eighteen twelve. And their biggest haul in one night, I think they said, uh, sorry, no, four days with 26 bodies. So if you wow. think, if that's pauper, that's from pauper graves. So they did those slightly differently. They, um, the money that is churning through the system is, is, quite, is quite phenomenal. The prices would have been passed on to the students. So the, the anatomists, Certainly around this time, so you've got two waves. So like this first wave's coming up around about 1810, 18, 18, 16, 18, 20. Um, and that's um, like the, the Crouch Gang in, or the Borough Gang in London. And um, they're driving prices up. And then it kind of dips and just kind of steadies away. And then bang, you get um, Burke and Hare. Like, I was going to ask about Burke and Hare because yeah. I always do a bit of a litmus test on what I should ask by asking um, family members or, or friends whether they know what something is. Um, and so I asked um, uh, the father of my children, do you know who Burke and Hare is? And his answer was no. So I did think very, very briefly. Yeah, we can do Burke and Hare. Who they are, yeah. Okay, so, um, so your second wave, 1828, um, is Burke and Hare in Edinburgh. So there's still people supplying cadavers, don't forget that. Uh, but Burke and Hare come, and no matter how many times people say it, they were not uh, body snatchers. They were murdered. They didn't pick up a, okay. a spade. Uh, no matter what you read, um, the only way they're linked with uh, body snatching is because they sold the bodies to the anatomists. Okay. So a dissection and well, that, that, that's quite different. I mean, that's yeah, it's, yeah, it's a whole different. big leap to go from taking a, something that's already dead to deciding that you'll skip that step for <laughs> for ease. I th yeah, I don't think I don't think I I, I, I can I can I can see very much why they did it. Um, money, obviously, ten pounds a body they got um, uh, as an average. I think yeah. and I, I think you've got to bear in mind how poor people were as well yeah. so yeah to put it in context I tend not to people link me with Bergen hair but I'm like they're murderers I've yeah. got my other 200 odd little men that nobody knows about that I'm concentrating on do you know what I mean so I still find their story fascinating it's it's I'm I'm starting to look at it a bit more in depth I'm I am starting to to read about it and write about it a bit more by no way a, an expert on the on the Burke and Hare thing. I'm in, I'm intrigued that there is a body snatcher that I do research is Mary Andrew or um, Andrew Mary Lee, who was supplying Robert Knox, who's the doctor that that Burke and Hare sold the the cadavers to, at the same time that Burke and Hare were. So he's still getting the the murdered victims of Burke and Hare, this doctor, but he's also getting the the usual supply from Mary Andrew, who has a gang of four, three or four um, in Edinburgh. And he's Edinburgh's most prolific gang leader, as it, as it were. But he, he writes a letter to Knox. I think it's on the day that Birkenhead's last victim is found, saying, I've got a, I've got a cadaver for you. Do you want the usual? The usual Mr Knox. <laughs> so that's where my interest with Burke and Hare comes in. How did they fit in with the, because Mary Andrew uh, to me is, is a prominent body snatcher in Edinburgh. And these are coming in and, and not stealing their line, like that's, that's the wrong word, or, or even business, because there is enough business to go around in Edinburgh. Um, just yeah, what what would the, what would You're they the fringe? Each other? Yeah, 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 that yeah, is really we, curious. You know like, what I mean. So so I'm I'm starting to to weave um, Burke and Hare's story in with what I already know. I've resisted going there for so long, uh, probably about well yeah, I've been doing this for fifteen years. So it's probably fifteen years <laughs> I haven't gone there with Burke and Hare. But now I'm like mm, actually I need to I need to start looking at that and thinking a bit more about it. And yeah, I can't, I can't, 
the, the, to me, there were murderers, and they always will be. Yeah. But, yeah. No, yeah. that's I, I agree. That's quite a big difference. I can't um, ignore them either, though. Do you know what I mean? Because of what what they did. You know, mm. was their packing method the same? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So packing method's really interesting. Doesn't it? I'll ask in a sec. <laughs> <laughs> they are really interesting. Let me tell you about that. This, this is where you're in. So I've been talking to um, Chris Woodyard. Do you know Haunted Ohio? Is it Ohio, Haunted Ohio Books on Twitter? No, but I will go look some up. She's really, yeah, I'll send you the link if you go. She's she, Chris Woodyard. She's on, she's on all the time. We we're talking about how, how the differences are between the UK and America, really. Uh, it's another, I'm, I'm slowly starting to move into America and, and see what the differences were. Purely because there's so much to learn in our own soil first, you know, it's just, you know, get my head around that, really. Um, and we were talking about how to squash them. So you would have transported a cadaver, you've got it out of the grave, you, some of them would have uh, carried it away, slung over the shoulders, okay, a naked corpse. So you, as, soon as, you, as soon as you dug it out of the grave, you have to strip it of everything. Because the body didn't, body didn't belong to anybody, okay, so it wasn't a theft. Just oh, okay. Okay, just a misdemeanor. So you got six weeks, six months. Um, I've seen six months, a couple of years. Yeah, Joseph Naples, a couple of years. Um, imprisonment, because it's it, it more of a misdemeanor. If you stole anything from the grave itself, it escalated to a felony, and then, you know, consequences transported. There is one story of student body snatchers. Again, love them. Um, stole a cadaver and the lace cuff of a burial shroud came off. But anyway, let me tell you about, so the, the, out of the grave, they've got uh, their grave clothes uh, taken off. So they're naked, basically, clammy, gray. And they have to get this thing back to the anatomy school or back to a safe house so they can pack it up. Um, you think of um, 1826 in Liverpool, in Hope Street, in big barrels, they were having about three or four cadavers in each barrel. So how on earth did they get them in there? They would have had to squash them and crack them and, you know, tie them up. Um, there's accounts where everything is trussed up like a chicken. So like the, the ankles are thrown up behind the neck and kind of and, and roped down, uh, pushed into a sack. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, uh, that's Don't okay. Me, are you? <laughs> no, 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 I'm not. But I hadn't realised how gruesome it is. I think in yeah. my head, I thought you you dug up a body and you slung it on a cart and you put like a bit of tarp, you know, not tarpaulin because well, no, 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 yeah, but, yeah. But, but a bit of canvas, a bit you know, a sheet, effectively or something, a bit of hessian sack <laughs> over it. You you know you you went dress it in clothes and stick it on the front. <laughs> yeah, yeah, or that kind of thing. And then you you know you you drove um obviously but not drove with the car drove with the horse <laughs> you rode over to the nearest you know position that had hired you and and they just you know in a dark alley picked it off the back of the car I had I hadn't thought about that kind of you yeah. know so yeah. like how far were these bodies being oh, transported wow. to need wow. to be packed to that degree so this is another bit of my fate I love I love finding out about stuff like this so they um they shipped them in from Ireland so big body snatching um, escapades in Dublin come in, usually went up to, to Scotland. Um, so there, gosh, you've been taught in at least a week easily, I would have thought. But anyway, either that, they used to put them into to boxes. Um, I do have some measurements, which I can tell you about three, three, three foot. God, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go that. <laughs> <laughs> you can see it there you go <laughs> yeah, so for anyone yeah. listening Susie is desperately trying to measure with her hands three foot you know <laughs> so if you think if you think of basically the cadaver is folded into three so you're you're right. talking of like the chest the chest the torso size really and it would yeah. have been squashed roped down squashed into a box and you would have packed it with a uh, bit of salt so like epsom salt straw sawdust anything to collect the juices and the fluids that's going to leak out and you would have popped it onto the back of a coach these coaches would have left leeds london liverpool carlisle everywhere heading up to edinburgh okay so okay. You, is, where... is that literally just because they'd run out of bodies in edinburgh 
<laughs> they wanted to discard they wanted to hide that they were stealing them so take them from further away from where yeah, you are yeah it gets a bit dry. too hot the demand okay. is too people aren't dying quick enough the, so the demand is the the demand is outstripping supply <laughs> for one you know um they uh, it's getting too hot in the edinburgh on, and surrounding parishes so don't forget the there's edinburgh aberdeen and glasgow um anatomy schools that are all wanting cadavers and lots of them um so the the body snatchers will be filtering out from there hitting the hitting the villages um villages are getting more aware so okay so we'll filter down so you filter down into the borders nothing really happens in northumberland because that's you know dead area for want of a better word but then from where you are from from the from further south they'll steal them and ship them back up into london Okay. okay. So, so they're shipping them all over, they're transporting them all over. Um, they were labelled up as um, pickled herrings, uh, to anything to disguise the, the smell, okay? So, <laughs> um, pickled herrings, bitter salts, uh, I've got a blog post, bitter salts and pickled herrings, which kind of gives you a bit more, um, but sometimes um, the smell kind of, you know, emanated from the corners obviously and carried on the noses of the ladies that were in the coach and uh, they stopped the coach and they would have had a look in some of these um some of these boxes and a pr prolific stopping point because it was a main interchange uh, is the turf hotel or you know, the royal turf hotel in newcastle um with a lot of a lot of cadavers were found there and then um buried in ballast hills um burial ground in newcastle now someone on twitter was mentioning actually do people get um find out about it and get reburied yes and no there are cases from the turf hotel um if so if they found a cadaver uh, in transportation uh they would have put an appeal in the newspaper you know or, or, or locally on you know in, in on the walls and stuff does anybody know about this uh this body does anybody you know uh, a 60 year old gentleman died about a week ago we think he's come up from london you know um would, they, would that kind of thing go in the newspapers or yeah too early? i suspect so i've not actually found anything um i am a the, the case that i'm thinking of it was the body was found in Ballast Hills and uh, sorry in the Turf Hotel, and he was um, an elderly gentleman. And his son um, recognised the description of him basically. In and I'm sure that was in a newspaper. And he and he came up and identified his father and took him back down, uh, back down to London. So it did happen that way. Um, but if the body had to be dumped because of, you know, you were being chased or, or something. You would have found it again that again that way. There's a lot of bodies that were stolen, say from London, and are buried up in Newcastle, Carlisle, Liverpool, Manchester. Presumably, the bodies being taken did they tend to be from the poorer people? A lot Could, were because it was so much easier, and they didn't have the money to to put on a more yeah. safe, for example. Yeah, they, they just had yeah. the flowers or the stones. Okay, um, and also pau pauper burials were different, so they would um, where. Um, a usual burial, they would have gone in and targeted the, the fresh soil on top of the mound and gone in and dug a, um, a like a shaft down to the head end, um, broken the coffin lid open. So they would have put sacking across um, where, the, where the edge of the, the, the shaft was really, and they piled the soil over, you know, onto the, onto the foot end, uh, put sacking down and then crowbar the, the lid open so it would snap usually across like the shoulder area. And pull the cadaver out that way, leaving the corpse, uh, the the coffin inside. Throw all the corpse, the uh, corpse shroud, burial shroud inside. Cover it all over, and it doesn't look as though it's been touched. With pauper burials, they actually took the coffins out, and because they're stacked up on top of each other, yeah, so they would have taken them out, taken them out there, and then put them put them back in. It's a fabulous story, and again, I can't remember where or where it is, but there was body snatchers targeting a pauper burial pit. And they, um, the, the parish watch knew that, that this was going on and uh, they were on the prowl and the body snatchers are in the pit. But the parish had put like uh, trap doors over uh, that, that bolted across with a metal bar 
and uh, a, a padlock on, obviously. Now the body snatchers had got a dummy key to get like skeleton key for this padlock and changed it and had their own little padlock on there, you know, and they're in and out and blah, blah. And uh, they were in there one night rifling the graves and the, the wardens came around, the watchers came around. And so they hid in the, the pit and the watchmen knew that they were in the pit and they locked them in there. <laughs> Just, and oh. How long did they stay in there? Did they get out of Asia or did they die in there? No, no, no. <laughs> I was going to say, oh my God. <laughs> no, no. Now, I think from the top of my head, I think they were in there either for an hour or overnight, certainly until the, the constables came, but they were in there for a while. You read a lot of stuff, so a lot of, a lot of my stuff, you'll just see a snippet in the newspaper and that'll be it. That's all you'll get. Do you think that's because they didn't want to create a kind of mass hysteria around, you know, if people were already really worried about it, worried to the point where they wanted watchtowers, where they were investing in this tech, essentially, to, to, to stop the bodies being stolen. Do you think there was a, you know, you, don't, you didn't want people getting kind of massively hysterical about it, you know? <laughs> So they kind no, of kept no, it quiet, no, no, no. or the church didn't want to kind of be be accused of not looking after the bodies properly, or you know why wouldn't that be? Would you think if that happened now, you know, oh. it would be front page news, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah. And, and I know it's relative because um, it would be a rarity now, where it was, it was obviously it was more common, but even still, um, you'd still think it would be like a bigger piece in the news. So I wonder what the what the reason is for it not being it's a it's you get both sides again so if they, if they find um a body snatcher and um the, the ghost goes to court the the coverage is huge okay okay they also like like now they'll put little bits in to try and sell the newspapers so, so it's sometimes gosh I'll, I'll send you some pictures for for some slides and and that if you want um it, it, just a little snippet and that's all you'll get. And they'll never, and they'll say, it can say something like um, two body snatchers were apprehended and taken to, you know, Bow Street magistrates. They're at trial next, next week. And you can never find anything. And it's like, oh gosh, you know, so the like dead ends, I, I have yeah. no doubt saying dead ends. But um, you I mentioned- there might have been an early case of fake news sometimes. Yeah, well, yeah. Well, yeah, a lot, a lot. Because um, after Burke and Hare, um, Birking became a terminology and everything in the newspaper, um, an assault, attempted attempted rape, um, um, I was going to say body snatching, but that's not the word I'm looking for, um, like um, um, robbery, like, yeah, like, oh, what's it called when you, when you, uh, mugging, something, oh, okay. yeah, yep. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, was down as like, you know, uh, another possible Birking or anything, it's a yeah. hype to hype things up but you were mentioning about um that the church not wanting to know it's interesting very rarely is it mentioned in the parish register that somebody has been snatched so if you have people you know doing the family history mm. you will may never know um you'll see it on the on the um on the burial on the baptism uh, burial registers and there's no there's no evidence sometimes you'll get it um, and say, you know, this body was taken, or, you know, if you, if you are looking for anything in, in um, the parish records, probably church wardens accounts, that kind of vestry minutes, where they said, right, you know, we have a meeting because um, we need to buy, we need to build a watch house or have a wall around and that kind of thing. Yeah, well, that, that kind of makes sense, actually, because, you know, it's that whole thing about you filled in a document, you've written down the bits that you had to write on it, you know, to, to go if they were then stolen say a week later you'd have to go get that ledger back out and rewrite it and yeah shame. add that it's note shame. and yeah and you certainly wouldn't put it in your bishop's transcripts for him to find out i tell you <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. Can you imagine? <laughs> so, what, so so that's a that's a good tip so if you were a family historian you 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 would be much more likely to find that kind of thing in church warden minutes and vestry minutes and yeah the first the first um notion of it is going to be in a newspaper um so the way i research is newspapers and because i'm looking for the body snatcher as as opposed to the snatch do you know what I mean? yeah but i mean then some of us may well be descended from oh yeah body snatchers i you know. know i know always were <laughs> so you, really are, seriously, us, seriously, you need to get in touch with me i mean you'll be top of my christmas card list <laughs> 
How fabulous. I mean, it's yeah, I, I, I doubt you'd ever know. Like, I don't think, I don't suppose it would be the type of story that would have been passed down your direct line. But I, I bet there are people out there who say, like, you know, I was told that we had a cousin. Yeah. That was because it's not it's not the sort of thing as a father you'd pass on to your son, by the way, son. Well, or what? your son would go, Yeah, my dad used to do this, and then it would pass down those stories, you know? But it might be that the uncle that everybody hated. <laughs> <laughs> don't know, don't yeah, know. yeah, it's it's weird what passes down. To be fair, um, one of the things that interested me earlier is you were saying about um, your your kind of non professional amateur amateur grave robbing, and your professional grave robbing. When you first started talking about grave robbing, I kind of assumed this was like you know maybe a small gang of people, but they were taking like one person here and there. But but you've you've obviously you know totally opened up my eyes to the fact that there was a lot more going on, and you talked about gangs in London. So what were the kind of differences between like an amateur who maybe have, you know, started off in the early days and then what you call the professionals or the gangs? Like how many bodies were they taking on average a night or, you know, roughly? And um, what, what was the difference with their methods? You know, how much more sophisticated mm -hmm. were they? So, um, so quantity wise, jump back to a student. They really just took what they needed at the time. Um, so it would have been, oh, we've got a, we've got a, a lesson or a, a lecture on, I don't know, gosh, muscles in the arm. Let's go and get, we have, we know that we haven't got a, a cadaver for the, for the for lesson. Let's go out. Five of them would have gone out, you know, two of them would have gone out, um, stolen it, put it on the table and they would have used every last bit of it. You know, there's, there's accounts where they would have kept them in, in tubs of brine. Yeah, um, and you fish around and see, right? Well, yes. Well, there's an arm. Yep, the heat that doesn't seem overly worked. I'll use and that. I, I know that's so gruesome, but I can't help thinking that if you didn't do that, like, how were they? How else could you possibly learn? You know, yeah, I can kind of, I can, I can see the logic. You know, yeah. and that thirst for knowledge as well to know it's how the bodies there. worked in a time where you didn't necessarily discuss it openly at the dinner table. <laughs> <laughs> the thirst for knowledge is just is is ridiculous you can really see especially when you start reading like the wider subject so like I don't know if you've read um Wendy Moore's The Knife Man um oh and Drew and Burke um Digging Up the Dead so it's about Sir Astley Cooper he was a you know body snatchers ally kind of thing it has a fabulous fabulous story and the, the thirst for knowledge for the early anatomists is just is phenomenal and they really didn't stop at, at you know getting if they wanted a, a body they would have would have gone out and, and got it so the students getting back to what we were saying the students um dug up literally what they needed <clears throat> in Aberdeen you have the Aberdeen yes it's Aberdeen Aberdeen Medical Society group of students um they they're ticking along quite nicely and then you know stealing the odd dog that they need to if they need to have a little practice or a dissection and then all of a sudden things dry up and they're like, oh, well, what, what do we do here? Our, our, our society that we were supposed to be um, studying, studying, you know, at night and having a little bit of extra dissection classes, we've got nothing to dissect on. So they were actively encouraged by the founded members to, you know, it's all right, it's going on down here, mate, get yourselves out and nick a couple of bodies and you'll be all right. So they, it was very much a, 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 we need it, we'll go and get it. Yeah. As it went on, so around about the turn of the century, so around about 1802, it's about 1810, it really starts to ramp up and the professionals come in on the scene. Mainly the, the gang in London that we were saying, now they're very slick. So before the student would have gone in, left, dug, dug up the coffin, probably pulled the coffin out, left it, left all the stuff all over the place. You know, somebody had gone to the parish, parish church the next day and thought, oh my God, we've been targeted kind of thing. Um, but it happened so um, infrequently that it wasn't it wasn't ignored because the the you know um, Royal College of Surgeons and, and, and put clauses in you know like for, for your indentures don't you know students if you're gonna if you're gonna steal you will be off your apprenticeship you know please don't do it yeah um, and then um, as by the time the professionals there they're really kind of um, no trace whatsoever the, they could target a, a graveyard for well in perpetuity if they were clever enough 
um, no, nothing, nothing out of place. They would have taken a body out within an hour, so they could have gone in, whipped it out, um, and, and straight out within an hour quicker at pauper, pauper burial pits, obviously. I, anyway. I was gonna. I, well, I was gonna ask you the, the when you talk when you talk about gangs and obviously getting the bodies out that quickly. <clears throat> were there people that were meant to be preventing these um, snatchings, like 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 the the watch wardens and and the grave diggers as well, that were um, in cahoots with the body snatchers? So they wouldn't have been able to steal the quantities of bodies probably as easily as they did if the if the officials weren't corrupt. OK, you um, they paid the watchman, bribed them to, to either um, turn a blind eye, keep the gate open, maybe to the churchyard. Um, some of them they bribed not to actually bury the, the, the body, so they would have had the funeral. But as they were filling the soil back up uh, into the grave, they would have moved the body up with the soil so that by the time it got to the near the top just a thin layer of soil would have been over the cadaver already in a sack ready and waiting you know to go policemen would have been or constables would have been um bribed the the coachman carters would have been bribed to get them all through the city every every stage somebody is bribed there's a fascinating story uh, about two body snatchers in lambeth who um applied for the job advert of watchers in the, the parish church <laughs> which i think is just fabulous they um william marshall and, um marshall and duffin that's all i can remember they're, they're called but they applied to be the watchers in the churchyard and surprisingly the snatchings kept happening <laughs> and the the parish the you know the, the parishioners got a bit bit suspect here and they started watching them and, the, and the, obviously they found out about them but yeah <laughs> did, did you get did you get loved ones that would you know keep an eye out mm, you know mm. do you sh do shifts especially <laughs> if you were poorer yeah yeah, yeah. there's a lot of that actually there's um you read about like loyal servants that have, have kept watch over over the master's grave um certainly after the anatomy act of 1832 so when body snatchings died down quite a bit um, you get people doing ad hoc watchings. You do get friends and relatives of the of the deceased watching. So you're watching constantly for about six weeks, which is quite a, a heavy. That's shift. a long time. Yeah, it, it yeah. That, that, that makes time. sense as to why you weren't able to maintain that, especially when you were working full time. Exactly. Um, exactly. And um, so if you think so, um, there was a dissecting season, so it was like from October to May. So that's when the body snatchers were out in, in force. So if you were going to die, you needed to die in the summer. But when the, when the um, private anatomy schools in London started putting on the, the summer dissecting classes, you know, like extramural classes, I wouldn't say you get a, a ramp up of, of snatchings during the summer months, but they're trickling, they're trickling there. So you were never really safe. So the more prevention and the more deterrence you could put in was certain, certainly helped. And what, so you mentioned the um, anatomy act there, it's, it's probably probably a good way to wrap up. What, yeah. what, what's, you know, how did this end? So Burke and Hare, funnily enough, we come back to these guys that are dominating the scene and always will dominate the scene. So in some, in some, in some respects, you've got to kind of include them into this story. They, um, started the the realization that hey something has to be done about this it's getting a bit out of hand now you know it was it was always it would just have got worse and worse and worse if they hadn't have stopped and said look we need to we need to be able to provide um the the anatomists with some teaching material for advancement we need to you know improve our knowledge but where's that going to come from because the law doesn't let us let us provide these. So it would have ramped up. Burke and Hare just cut out the middleman and, and you know, shocked the world, really, or the nation. Um, and so um, a first anatomy act, rumblings of anatomy act um, started to come out. And then have you heard of the, the Italian boy, the, um, the London Burkers? 
in 1831. No. Yeah, that's another that's another chat, a whole new <laughs> chat. <laughs> Part two. Um, sounds great. Yeah, I'm up for that. Um, they um, basically were murdering and body snatching. So they were doing two, two lots, but they were, um, they stole the body of supposedly Carlo Ferrari, um, a little Italian boy on the streets of London, and they would drug them with laudanum, get them drunk and hang them upside down in, in the well. And oh my God. Yeah, the things that they, they found, maybe that's an after hours, that's a Patreon kind of <laughs> uh, talk, that one. Uh, fac- fabulous, fabulous. The, the book to get on that is um, Sarah Wise, the Italian boy. Fabulous. Absolutely. Um, but with that, it was really, you know, something has to be done. So the Anatomy Act came, came was pushed through Parliament, passed on the 1st of August, 1832. Um, and it said, the unclaimed dead of the workhouse. So somebody had to take the brunt of it. And it was the, it was the unclaimed dead already happening in the likes of in Paris, the unclaimed dead. You know, corpses, body snatching over there was literally what well was unheard of. You know, I think it was five was it five francs for a for a body or something? Really, you know, it's probably extortion. I don't know, but really low low price. Do you know? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So yeah. So were there female body snatchers? Um, what kind of things did? Yeah. And if not, what other kind of roles did women? So <laughs> women were mainly used as scouters. So um, in order to find out. In order to steal a body, you need to find out where it is, obviously. Um, the gangs did go around and, and wander around, um, certainly on a Sunday, because that's usually when the funerals took place. And so they would pretend to be mourners and wander around. The women could get closer to the, to the mourning party. They could find out what the body, uh, what, you know, what the deceased die of. So if it was you know, a, a, a disease, they might leave it if it was a, a, a particular unusual ailment they say right well we'll, we'll target that one then because that'll bring us more money you but, say about disease did they used to did, did body snatchers used to worry that if they dig up a body that's got a that's got a disease something in things like scarlet fever where it's quite contagious they're um, um i wouldn't say worry <laughs> they're would, they, would they, they think i'll um, leave that one because it died of <laughs> the plague <laughs> it's not the plague obviously but you know what i mean because it died of something highly contagious like measles or yeah um, there's there's a there's smallpox, a, there's a, there's a, smallpox you yeah know? yeah um i'll leave that one because i don't want to get that yeah but yeah uh i'll lift it up with the end of your shovel <laughs> Sorry, sorry, <laughs> that, that's that's my humour. That sorry. No, it's okay. <laughs> I've got quite out. a dark sense of humour. You're listening, well. editor man. Put that out. Um, there's a case of a body snatcher um, being caught, and um, I think there's two of them actually went to the to the uh, magistrates court, the local lockup, and the cadaver went with them. Went into the the cell, and there was that much of a like a mob. They said, "Oh, by the way, the body has got cholera." And the whole place just cleared this end, you know. So then they used it to make their escape, obviously. But I don't know of any where I know where they've dug up cadavers that the thought were going to be fresh, but haven't quite been so fresh um, when they've dug it up. Um, and so they've taken, they'll have chopped an arm off because you could still sell that. They'd have knocked the teeth out, maybe chop the hair off, make some wigs. So there was things, I maybe chop the head off, that was a popular one. Um, so, so it was quite popular. No, hours. it was quite. Yeah, no, sorry. Am I doing after hours take like an extra? Um, but what? So they would chop heads off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Joseph Naples, a member of the uh, Borough Gang in London, um, his uh, speciality, as it were, was chopping head, heads off and extremities. And wow. selling, you could still get you could still get some money money for them. All body snatchers worth of salt would have whacked the teeth out with a brad or beforehand because you could sell the teeth to the dentist don't forget that you know George yeah yeah because your fake yeah fake teeth were real teeth exactly exactly so they're all you know majority of the higher oh my god I just got these wealthy people who've lost teeth who are walking around with a dead man's exactly not even just a dead man's teeth but like stolen dead man's teeth which is somehow so much worse you know (laughs) (laughs) well i mean and there's cases of quite a few cases of body snatchers where they've been caught so the first thing they did they would knock the teeth out then put them in your pocket 
Because if you're caught with the cadaver and you need to make a run for it, you drop the body, run, and you've still got the teeth to sell. That's but right. There's, loads of, there's um, cases where they the find the jaw in the pockets and, you know, and it's like, so they're really brute force taking these things out. Okay. Yeah, because like to the dentist, here, do you want do you want the jaw as well? Kind of. <laughs> Is is I find it really incredible because I think we tend to think of our ancestors as being um, a bit not definitely not more squeamish because they didn't have the you know the paracetamol and things like that that we have today to, that makes us probably more squeamish um, but but more uh, more religious potentially mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. therefore um, you know you you, t you think of oh, I'm thinking of. Um, Ian Foster's A Room with a View, and I, I know that's a later period, it's Victorian, but, but you know, they, they can't say the word stomach at the dinner table, it's the <laughs> S word when they're, I just remember doing it at school and it being, you know, we, we don't say stomach, we say the S, oh. S word, you know, that's kind of quite middle class Victorian. Yeah. Um, and so you, it's fascinating that then you've got this, you know, this dark heart underbelly where, um, you know, not only are they not squeamish, but they, they haven't got that kind of, um, that fear Mm, that fear mm. of the dead I mean like I don't particularly mm. like walking around a grave graveyard at night you know it just kind of gives me the creeps um yeah. so to have that um complete lack of fear of the supernatural or you know isn't necessarily what we'd expect no no you think they're genteel and, and very well mannered well either that or or very superstitious mm, mm. um and yeah. it, I, I, I don't know I mean it's probably a myth that you you think of people in the past as being more so superstitious than we are today um because they didn't necessarily have all the answers that we have today if yeah, you see what I mean yeah, so yeah. um but you know things like you know finding it okay to dig somebody up and knock all their teeth <laughs> kind of I kind know, of stuns yeah. that on their head really isn't it you know the, they're bit. obviously not frightened of being haunted afterwards or yeah. you know I mean uh, uh, like you saying there about going into to a graveyard and, and stuff. I mean, they, they're in they're in the graveyard at night, and they they are they're actually you know they're digging it they're digging a body up to walk through a graveyard anyway would would like well like you say I'd be petrified. There's some of these plate. Well, I, I I do a lot on my own, so I'm like you know wandering around these places on my own, and I go to them so early in the morning, so I'm there on my own. And they're so remote, some of these places, that it frightens the life out of me. Mm. Especially because I try and get brave and go into the mort house or, or watch house, you know what I mean? And that's in the daylight. So these guys, they must have, well, I mean, well, half the time they were drunk to, to stomach with what they, were, what they could do. What they were, oh, know, really? Yeah, yeah, a lot, a lot of them. Yeah. Yeah. So, and to, to mask the smell of, yeah. of anything, to stomach it, really. Well, look, I will have to wrap it up there. Otherwise, I'd love, I could chat to you all night. It's been amazing. Well, if Thank you want you to so do it again, much. seriously, I'm, I'll, I'll, you know, there's so much to talk about. With that would be people. great. Thanks so much for joining me, Susie. It was really great to talk to you. I will make sure there is a link to your um, blog in the in the notes and all the fantastic resources you've mentioned. Thank Perfect. you very much. Thank you very much. It's been excellent. Thank you, Natalie. <laughs> if you enjoyed this video, don't forget to hit subscribe or visit me at www.genealogystories.co.uk.